Are these tints too dark to drive? And are these headlights too bright? So distracting. We measure. You're registering at 29%. Smash. The tint actually held the glass. And reveal the danger, the law, and the ultimate fix. Your marketplace starts now. We're gearing up for a driving experiment. We want to know, is it safe to drive with tinted windows? We've got three cars and three very different levels of tint on their windows. How will tinted windows affect visibility, especially at night, especially since half of fatalities happen when it's dark? You're here tonight because we're going to test your tints. The rules are straightforward. So we want you to back into that street, but the track is anything but. Okay, I'm just gonna make it a small course. Can't make that one. The truck's too big. This is not your typical course. There's a moose. <laughs> and these are not your typical obstacles. And then we got a little grizzly back there as well. All this because there's a big debate raging about tinted windows. Many of you hate them. I have a very big concern with the number of deeply tinted windows. It's a safety issue. When I'm crossing the street, I'd like to make eye contact with the driver so that I know that they saw me. But if it's tinted window, I don't know if they've seen me or not. If it is raining and if it is night and if you have tinted windows, you cannot see your blind spot. To test that out, we're sending our drivers through our marketplace track one at a time. He's driving considerably slower in reverse. Even throwing it in reverse over a final section. Oh, now's the tricky part. Where we're putting those dark rear tints to the ultimate test. All right! Hey, okay, you did great. You didn't kill any animals. No animals were harmed in the filming of this segment. Meet our drivers, the straight pipes. Yuri Tarashin and Jacob Robel are Canadian YouTubers with more than a million followers who can't get enough car talk. So we do have a seven-speed single-clutch transmission. And Jody Lai is an automotive journalist in Toronto. Jody, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Jacob is here with his special edition Ford F-150 Raptor. So this actually is factory tinted, so it's only the back windows that are tinted. The front windows are not tinted. Then Yuri. 2010 Volkswagen GTI with, I think, 80% tints. That means a lot of light is blocked, making it harder to see in or out. So where are the tints on your car? Every window. Every window. Except for the windshield. And Jody is in her 2015 VW Golf that also came used with tinted windows. Do you have any idea how dark they are? Yeah, so I got them assessed by a professional tinting company. You did? Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah, so in the back, they said it was five. That was the level. And in the front, they said it was 35. So that's pretty dark. Yeah, I think the closer you get to zero, the darker it is yeah. and, like, the less light is coming in. That's exactly what it means. I decided to get the windows tinted after my son was born. Get this off. In Clarence Creek, Ontario, Ann Paquette says she got tints because of the glare that bothered her son, Jeremy. It really helps. He's actually comfortable back there. Even for me, like I find I'm, I'm quite light sensitive. Keeps the car a lot cooler during the summer. I do like my privacy inside the car. I find also like discourages anyone from trying to steal. The reasons might be legit, but some people's tints are anything but. The white car. Here in Ottawa, police say they issued 566 tickets last year for tinted windows that were too dark or on the windshield. So this is a tint reader. It's going to give me a reading as to how dark these windows are. In Ontario, the law is somewhat subjective. The tint can't obscure or limit visibility. If police can't see into your car, that's a problem. So you're registering at 29%. Oh. That's how much light is being able to pass through. My uh, my police vehicle behind me, its driver's window registered at 82%, okay? okay? With the majority of light blocked, police say bust it. But today, these are educational stops, no tickets. As you were driving up, I had a hard time identifying as to who the driver was. 
That's what usually prompts the pullover. But to measure it, bring out the tint meter. 86% of the light is blocked? Yeah. Did you know that? I have no idea. What do you think when you hear that now? It's fairly dark, I guess. Three stops. These drivers have tints that range to only allow 14 to 29% of light in. Way less than what's legal or safe, according to police. So there's no fines coming today. Uh, just for your information, it could be a $110 fine. Really? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's that dark. <laughs> Ottawa police say there is one benefit to tinted windows, the way they break in the event of a collision. We want to see for ourselves. The expectation is that the area that's tinted will be somewhat held together by the tint itself. So we'll see what happens. Look, it, it came off in strips. The tint actually held the glass on just like Ottawa police say it would. Still, no harm in testing twice. I'm aiming again right in the middle. Holy shit. So it broke into a million pieces, but like in bigger pieces. And that part that's not tinted at the bottom, it ended up everywhere. Even still, police say the way it breaks doesn't outweigh the risks, especially when it comes to seeing and being seen. Remember, Yuri's tints were really dark, and they're on every window except the front. Here, do it up for me. Oh my god. It's hard for me to see your face. But it's easy for me to see outside while I'm driving at night. What do you think would happen if you got pulled over and a cop was asking you about these tints? I'd say I don't know. I, I kind of think you'd be in trouble. <laughs> How'd the others make out? Some careful maneuvers a couple of near misses, oh, oh, and some aha moments. So reversing is a little bit harder just because it's night out. It was more difficult to go in reverse where I do have my tints. So I did have to do it at a slower pace, but I didn't hit anything. Walk me through what the experience was like for you. I couldn't really see too much without going slower and looking in my mm -hmm. side view mirrors, and I didn't really know where I was backing up into. Looking out the sides was challenging, you were saying? Sometimes when I'm backing this thing up at night, I'll just roll down the windows even if it's cold because it is hard to see out the side view mirrors. So maybe okay. that's why I haven't hit anything yet. It's been a journey for all of us. Were you surprised when you heard how dark they were? I was honestly a little bit embarrassed because like I'm, I'm an automotive journalist, like this is what I do for a living, but I never thought about my tents until Marketplace contacted me. I've never felt impeded by them. I always thought right. that I had full visibility and that it was safe. So it was a bit of a surprise. Afterwards, Jody and Yuri both say they'll remove their tints or go much lighter. It would have such an impact on the safety of pedestrian cyclists, officers, the general public. Back in Ottawa, police say the law needs to be specific about what's allowed and what's not and get tougher. Sergeant Mark Gation brought in the tint meters for the force. In Quebec, they have the law that I want to mimic. And it, it states in there that if you put a tint meter on your car and it reads below 70, so 69 and lower, automatic ticket, no questions. There's only one uniform rule across the country. Drivers have to be able to see out of the front window. Otherwise, it depends on where you live. I think it would be helpful for all Canadians if there was just a standard test, even the way they measure it, like 5 and 35. What does that even mean? Right. Apparently, different provinces or different police look at that number differently, and that number can mean different things to different people. Makes us wonder what's actually legal. Our window tint is available in a variety of shades. Our team makes calls across the country to window tinting businesses. What's the biggest benefit of getting the tints on my windows? From the East Coast. It's 99% of the UV rays, so you don't get the fading and the seeds and sunburn on your skin. To the prairies. What do you want to gain? There's privacy, keeps the heat out, okay. looks cool. To the West Coast. But what's actually allowed? Legally, you're not allowed to do the front. Every shop tells us what's legal and what's not, depending on the provincial rules. I can tint it, but it's illegal. We hear that a lot. I do any ones you want. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. What windows can I get done? We do every window. If I wanted 5% on the front, could you do it? I could, but uh, 
That's still gonna be illegal, so which is up to you. Jack Mundy says a quarter of the cars we see seem to have illegally tinted windows. Can't see anything. He's the head of the board for the International Window Film Association. Oh, that looks like a lot of tint. If the shops know that tinting certain parts of the car is illegal, why do they do it? Money talks. The almighty dollar. The almighty dollar does talk. How does it sit with you, though, that every shop we called, all of them said that they would do it anyway? That's tough. I, I don't agree with it, but it's tough. We know that ultimately the law says, right, it's the person driving the car who's going to get the ticket. They're the ones yes. violating the Highway Traffic Act. Correct. But do you see the shops playing some role here? They should have some responsibility. Do you advocate for making one rule right across the country? Is that something you guys have asked for? You'll never have that because it's provincial jurisdiction, it's aftermarket jurisdiction. Would you prefer that? Utopia, yes. <laughs> Not much his association can do. The shops won't get charged. It's up to the drivers to follow the law. Everybody seems to be tinting their windows these days. But the law didn't stop Cole Halaki in Edmonton. He drives a lot for work and says the $400 solution cut down on his light sensitivity. I'd be on the highway with one hand blocking my uh, side mirror because the light was just so bright and so a little bit of a safety concern because um, you're now taking the hand off the steering wheel to block light that's blinding you. Uh, so this is my car here. Uh, you can see the tint, it's quite dark. He knew he was breaking the law when he got these tints that only let 20% of light in, but he says now he feels less irritation when driving. I would be prone to get a ticket for an equipment violation, no different than uh, a burnt out tail light or something. I'm sure I'll get one one day and when I do, I'll, I'll happily pay for it though because um, it, it, it's, it's worth it to me. So if you're blinded by the lights, is there anything else you can do about that? The engineer, the mechanic and the auto pro team up. That's definitely a challenge. The glaring truth about those lights. Get more Marketplace. Sign up for our weekly newsletter at cbc.ca slash marketplace. This is your Marketplace. We took your windows to the track, measured them. So you're registering at 29%. Yeah, it's, it's that dark. Even smash them. It all starts with your messages that come in fast and furious. You love them or hate them. Hundreds of emails. And then we notice something else keeps coming up. Glare. Bruce, this place is so cool. Hi, Charlie. Hi. Nice to see you. This is the Challenging Environment Assessment Lab. To get the lowdown on Glare, we head underground to the Kite Research Institute. Guess what they have? A glare simulator. And this is Driver Lab, easily the most realistic driving simulator we have in Canada. No way. And we're gonna go for a drive. Bruce Haycock is the lead scientist and engineer here. So I've turned out the lights now. Now it's nighttime in our simulator. This feels like just like driving on a country road in Canada. <laughs> it's so distracting. And just like in the real world, the headlight glare bugs me. I notice it when they're coming towards me, but I also notice it in the rear view mirror, too. It's not nearly as big of a problem with a lot of street lighting and, and ambient light. The whole point of these labs is to recreate real world challenges. We take you to a dark country road, so there's no ambient lighting. Uh, we allow your eyes to get nice and well adjusted to the dark so that your pupils dilate out letting in lots of light and then we go for a short drive and a car comes past you. That car's headlights are on, it generates a lot of light. The problem is that light is going to hit your eyes. I would be like flashing <laughs> that person to be like, turn off your high beams. They're not high beams, that's low beam. Oh my gosh. Am I a wimp or are these bad? That's North American average headlights wow. is what you're seeing there. Bruce tells me I react like a lot of people. He says newer cars have smart technology that automatically changes the headlights when there's an oncoming car. The feature is common in Europe. They have headlights that are made 
in much the same way as our glare panel is made, that it's an array of LED lights. And you can individually turn those lights on and off and change the brightness of them. Okay. If there's a car coming the other way, they use advanced driving technologies to detect that there is another car there and turn off the lights that are pointed at the other driver so that there is effectively no glare. And it is a feature in some newer, pricier cars sold in Canada. But since it's unlikely everyone will go out in spring for that, he has another idea to deal with glare. The headlight beam has a pattern where it's brighter in some areas right. and dimmer in others. You want that bright pattern to be on the road and not on the other drivers. So improperly aimed headlights are often a problem. Headlight aiming? Hmm, time for us to put that to the test. Two cars offset as if they're in highway lanes to shed some light on glare. We ask a three-man team to meet us, the U of T electrical engineering professor, the auto equipment pro, and the veteran mechanic. Olivier, you made it. Yes, I Hi. made it. <laughs> Hi, how are you? First up, Olivier Trezcas, who knows all about lighting and brings this gadget with him, a lux meter. So we're going to measure the illuminance coming from the uh, oncoming vehicle. Right. See how much glare is actually arriving uh, inside your car. OK. Um, so we're going to get, like, a number. That's right. Oh, that, that's the sensor, I, I, that yep. little yeah, light that's right. thingy. So it's that's supposed to be, like, my eye, basically. Correct. Olivier gets the first reading from the vehicle that faces mine. It's close to four lux. Basically, a measurement to capture light intensity and how it affects us. Those are too bright. This is a standardized test. Right. The glare that actually reaches the, uh, the driver's eyes depends on the alignment, obviously, on this, you know, the, uh, the type of vehicle and also the mm -hmm. height. So what we find is that, uh, for example, SUVs that have lights that are mounted higher will mm -hmm. tend to give more glare. So that's, that's definitely a challenge. You brought your aimer. I brought my aimer. In this case, though, the team thinks the brightness is probably an issue of poor alignment, not height. We want to point that at the center of the light. We want to find out. So Russ Murdoch has a gadget, too, an optical aimer that a lot of mechanics use in their shops. We can see on the screen on inside the box uh, where the beam pattern is and we adjust uh, to the to the grid lines that are on the aiming screen. Okay, so this is basically going to show us where a good headlight should sit. Where they should be legally. Versus where this one in this car actually sits. Exactly. He takes the reading. Turns out the hot spot on these lights is on the right, so the headlights are misaligned. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because glare coming off of misaligned headlights, it's even worse when the weather conditions are bad. Being on the road, you can't see what lane you're in. Some people have ended up in the ditch. So we know it's too bright. We know it's misaligned. Now what? And Mark, come on in. Longtime mechanic Mark Sash Anderson has the fix. Now, I thought you would have a whole whack load of tools with you. On this particular vehicle, all we need is one Phillips screwdriver. As a driver, you don't really notice it because they're not the ones that are actually driving into it and right. see it in front of it. Turns out this one's an easy fix. In no time at all, Mark tweaks the angle, cross-references with the aimer, and voila, the headlights are aligned. But the big question is, are they still too bright? Now we're going to see if it actually made a difference because we're going to get Olivier to check the luminance. We have fixed the alignment, so... Drum roll. It's at uh, 3.6. 3.6. OK, so it did make a difference. Yeah, substantially lower. Substantially lower. It doesn't sound like a big jump, but Olivier says it can make a difference for people bothered by glare, especially considering US tests show around 50% of cars come misaligned right off the production line. Wear and tear can cause shifts, too. All our experts agree people need to get their headlight alignment checked as part of routine maintenance. But right now, no one's forcing them to, and that's a big part of what's causing those glare issues. It's called discomfort flare because it's uncomfortable. Back at the Kite Research Institute, Bruce says they measure how headlight glare can affect people differently. 
If it's more of a problem, then it gets into what's called the disability glare, where it's really having an impact on your ability to do things, in this case, driving. What are some of the potentially detrimental consequences that you could see as a result of a too bright light in your eyes? There are simply more accidents at night than there are during the daytime. Yeah. If something happens, say, jump out behind a, an oncoming car, you'll have a much harder time seeing it. Coming up next, we've got the fix for that glare, and it's really simple. You won't want to miss it. Got a story you think Marketplace should investigate next? Tell us about it on email, Twitter, or Facebook. This is your Marketplace. It's clear there's a problem with misaligned beams. They bother a lot of us. Science shows even more as we get older. And no one's forcing drivers to fix them. Back at the Kite Research Institute, while I'm cruising and wincing, scientist Bruce Haycock shares a simple tip to help. You have to focus on the right side oh. of the road to, to try and take your eyes away from the source of the light a bit. That, that oh, you yeah, can it does still help. see down here. But, with but you know what, car just coming, glancing a little bit to the right does sort of cut out some of the intensity, I feel like. Yeah, it definitely does. You have to kind of take your eyes away from, from the light source. Prue says that slight shift means my pupils won't dilate as much from that oncoming light. Some would say the easy answer to glare problem is just have automated cars for everybody and take the driver away. 